Hey everyone, I'm so excited about today's episode, but first want to let you know that this show is made possible by Fortune Builders. I also want to take a minute to invite you guys to an amazing opportunity to learn from some of the top experts in the real estate industry about how to get started in real estate or scale an existing business to the next level. Fortune Builders is hosting a one-day webinar to help you learn about real estate investing in today's market. So throughout the show, if you feel like you're ready to get started, go to fortunebuildersshow.com to register. Again, that's fortunebuildersshow.com to register. If you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, you'll find a link right below the show so you can get there that way as well. And please remember that the content of this, this show and every show is for educational purposes only. Myself or our guests are not gonna be providing any legal, uh, financial, or professional advice. If we share specific results, they are attributed to an individual or a business, and we can't guarantee the results will happen for you, those earnings or the income will match those figures. The bottom line is there's always risk when investing in real estate. You can make a lot of money or you can lose a lot of money, and it's hard work. But that doesn't mean we can't have fun doing it. So let's get into today's episode. From a team that has $1 billion in real estate investment experience. A show to help you learn the strategies and systems it takes to get started investing in real estate. This is the Fortune Builders Real Estate Investing Show. everyone, J.D. Asajan, and welcome to, you guessed it, the Fortune Builders Real Estate Investing Show. Back at it today with a great episode. We're uh, coming at you with another case study, live case study of a very recent deal in San Diego, California from CT Homes. I'm uh, joined, uh, as always, on these case studies by none other than Dan Wright, Daniel Wright, the right stuff. The right stuff, baby. The right stuff, our acquisitions director here at CT Homes, and uh, we got a lot to cover. But as always, we got to hit you with the, the phrase of the week, the word of the week, the acronym of the week. Uh, this week, ladies and gentlemen, hold on to your trousers. Oh, oh, oh. So, such a good sound. The phrase of the week is H-O-A. I'll say that again slower in case you didn't catch it. H-O-A. Or as Dan pronounces it, HOA. HOA. It's Hawaiian, right? <laughs> it's Hawaiian. Uh, that is directly related to the case study, the property that we're going to cover today. Some of you may, of course, know what that acronym stands for. But we're going to get into all that and much, much, much more on this week's show. So... Let's get into it. All right, so we're ready to uh, drop some knowledge on you with another case study. Of course, Dan joining us today as always for these case studies. And our format is very similar to what we've done in the past. And uh, we're gonna go through some slides uh, breaking down this particular transaction from acquisition to renovation to sales Correct me if I'm wrong, Dan, but I believe this is the first time that we've case studied a uh, condominium on the uh, show. Is that correct? That is correct. So no need to correct you because you're not wrong. Okay. So it is It is the first time. Thank you um, for that clarity. And uh, there's a lot of uh, similarities between a uh, condo and a single family home with regards to uh, points of uh, acquisition, renovation, and sale. But there are also a lot of differences, too, that we'll get into as well on this particular transaction. When I say that this is a recent case study, we're talking like uh, weeks old from when mm -hmm. we sold it. And uh, super relevant, the market's been changing as, uh, as we know, and I'm sure a lot of us watching and listening know as well. Um, and so it's good to stay plugged in with the show, the podcast, all the other training that we do, because you know the market changes and we change with it. As a reminder, for those of you really kind of thirsting, hungering, desire more information, fortunebuildersshow.com is where you can go to get a lot more training specifically around uh, finding and funding deals. Fortunebuildersshow.com is uh, uh, taught by one of our top trainers. So go there, get registered. If you're watching the show, you can click on the link below it. If you're listening, of course, go to fortunebuildersshow.com to get more information. You know, this is, uh, we're going on our 19th year here investing at CT Homes, and you know, I, I've 
I've seen a lot these last like 18 months have been very dynamic with what the market's done and doing now. And um, so we'll keep you updated as the uh, as these shows uh, come out and you're watching them and listening to them as to what's going on in the marketplace, which we'll talk about later. But let's go ahead and get into this case study. We'll talk about where it's at. Um, you know, obviously San Diego is where the property is at, but specifically where it's at in San Diego, the acquisition strategy and Dan will break down some uh, some of the details of there, how we were able to acquire the property, the lead source, some differences when it comes to buying condos, what we look at. Um, and so let's start there on the acquisition side. Uh, this particular property, if you're if you're looking, if you're not watching this show and listening, you should go back and watch these shows, all of them really, but certainly the case studies, because there's a lot of visuals that you won't catch listening, but you'll get the intent of what the um, the lessons are. This particular property is on Cape May Avenue, Unit 101 in America's Finest City. That's not my name for it. That's the nickname for it, San <laughs> yes. Diego. Um, on Cape May, 5015 Cape May. Now, um, the picture that we're showing on the screen right now is of the front of the unit. It is a condo. <laughs> One of uh, 50 units, right? There's 50. Was there 50 units? Is there 50 units in this? I think it was closer to 30. 30, okay. Yeah, it, it was still 30. quite a bit though. So 30 units in this complex. But as with any piece of real estate, the, the true value, one of the biggest driving forces of the value, and how do we determine value is where it's located. So let's, let's start there. Dan, I know you're uh, intimately familiar with oh, yeah. uh, this yeah. part of town. You used to live there. It was your first uh, purchase in San Diego when you moved here. And what a great purchase it was. It was a great purchase. Yeah. Worked out. And it was a condo also. It was, it a, was condo. a condo. Yep. also. So why don't you talk a little bit about where Cape May is located um, for those of us watching or those of us listening um, so they can get a familiarity with the with the location. Yeah, definitely. So the condo is um, it's in a part of, of San Diego called Point Loma, obviously that's the that's the bigger area, but as we break it down in neighborhood, it's it's Ocean Beach. Mm. So it's um you know very uh bohemian style. That's a great description for you it. You know you get some uh, some hippies, very artistic people mm -hmm. live there, and you got a nice uh, dog beach and restaurants and bars and just the, just the whole scene. It's great very walkability, awesome walkability. Yeah. So. You know, when this when we saw this for the first time on the MLS, that's that's the source that we used to acqu to acquire this property. Um, you know, looking at it, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is two blocks from the sand. Yeah. Uh, you're two blocks from the restaurants. And, you know, it's that that part of OB like parking is is a nightmare. It's and tough. so when this had two parking spots as well, that was very attractive. Yeah. So for those of you that are watching us right now, you can see it's completely surrounded by water. And for those of you that aren't, I just described, we're looking at a map view and there's water all around Point Loma. And like Dan said, the access that this particular uh, property and unit has is just tremendous. You can walk to the pier, tons of great restaurants. It's just a really, really nice, fun place to live. And um, so yeah, speaking of fun, J.D., mm. do you know what the original name for Ocean Beach was? Oh, man. I feel like I should know that. I know you know the answer. So <laughs> like, uh, Ocean Beach, the original name for Ocean Beach. Yeah, I'll help you out because okay, this please. is... Um... Give me a, give me a life, some lifeline. Oh, uh, okay. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Oh, man. Uh, well, it has to do something with Muscle Beach, but that's in Venice. Correct, but you're also um, very hot. Muscle Beach, Muscle... Fitness, fitness beach, fitness. Uh, you know, I'm gonna stop you there. Okay. You got it right with Muscle Beach. Did but I really? It's, but it's not the muscles you're thinking of, like <laughs> like you and I have, because <laughs> yeah. we're so jacked. It's uh, it's muscle like the shellfish. Oh. So back in the 1800s, you know, I'm such a history buff. <laughs> um, it had this an abundance good. of mussels, the shellfish. So wow. that, that's what they named it. When the developer came in, he's like, "That's not, that's not a, a sexy name." Yeah. So that's when it got changed to Ocean Beach. Ocean Beach. beach. Interesting. I did not know that. Ladies and gentlemen, you learn a lot on this show, um, not, uh, not to mention a little bit of history as well. Yeah. So Muscle Beach, now known as Ocean Beach, a section within Point Loma. And um, yeah, so all those things add value, the proximity to the water, history of the, uh, of, of the uh, location, obviously the unit itself, which we'll, we'll certainly look at. As Dan mentioned, this was listed on the multiple listing service. 
And so Dan will talk about in a moment uh, some of the intricacies of the negotiation, how we're able to acquire it, motivation of the seller. We initially went into contract at uh, $621,000, okay, uh, 950 square feet. Is that how big the condo? Uh, yeah, 910. Yeah, so 910, two bedroom, two bath. Um, obviously, a lot of the value is in the location. Our net purchase price is 605000 I think on the last case study, we mentioned this. The difference between our contract price, as we discussed here, of 621 and our closing price or our net purchase price of 605 is the commission. So not always, but in this transaction, I, J.D. Sajan, represented CT Homes on the buy side. Mm -hmm. And then that commission that would go to me, the agent, doesn't go to me, the agent. It reduces our net purchase price on the home. Um, and that ended up being 605000 we bought the condo in February, February 25th of 2022. We had an initial after repair value, what we thought the home would, or the condo would trade for when we were done of 750,000 and a renovation budget of 45,000. So we'll get into the renovation, get into the sale of course, but, but Dan, why don't you break down some of the um, things that went into, you know, the filtering of it on the MLS, mm -hmm. conversations yeah. with the agent, motivation of the seller, et cetera. Yep. So it was listed on the MLS as as we we talked about on a um, on a Wednesday. Okay. And so, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was listed on Tuesday. Tuesday. We saw it Wednesday morning because okay. we built every morning. Um, you know, the price seemed average. It didn't scream that it's a great deal. Um, what and, was it listed at? So it was listed at six forty. Six forty. Six forty. Um, the more we looked into it. Uh, they weren't far off from what we could pay for it. So as you mentioned, you know, our contract price was 621. That's mm -hmm. that's what the seller sees is, is 621. Um, we weren't the only offer. They did have two higher offers that were financed. Uh, but talking to the agent, she had told us um, that the heater didn't work hmm. and the stove was malfunctioning. Okay. And it was a trust sale. Okay. So... You know, the trustee did not want to make repairs. Yeah. They they weren't local. They wanted ease. And so with the financed offers, they would have had to make repairs. Got and, it. and there's a few more steps and a yeah. longer close. So our offer was lower. And, you know, she told us, I have higher offers. Yeah. You know, kind of telling us to come up, but we, we couldn't pay more. You know, we were at our threshold. That's where we needed to be. And um, a week later, so it was on the market for one week. One week later, uh, she called us up and said, congratulations, nice. we're, we're taking your offer. So the seller did leave money on the table, but we've learned over the years that price isn't everything. Yeah. You know, it, it's also the terms as well. Yeah. So that's a big lesson Dan just mentioned. And I want to reiterate it again, that prices is, is only one term in a contract. And sometimes it's the only term that a seller cares about, and sometimes it's not. And, and this is a great example of that. You know, the reason I want to highlight that is because I, we, we've trained thousands of investors and will continue to do so. And many times an investor will come and say, well, you know, the property was listed. I, had to, I was only able to pay a number that was much lower. Um, I didn't get my offer in because I didn't think the seller would accept it. Well, if you never get your offer in, you have really zero chance of getting the property. Um, zero chance. Zero right. chance. <laughs> right. So, you know, always submit your offer, get information from the seller or the, or the listing agent as to motivation, which Dan talked about, and uh, as much information as you can to write the strongest offer. And this is an example of we could pay what we could pay as investors, submitted our offer. And for the reasons Dan mentioned, the seller left money on the table because of they didn't. They didn't want to do any work. They didn't want mm -hmm. to go through the hassle. They wanted ease of closing. It wouldn't have trade. It wouldn't have been able to sell to a traditional buyer because of the work that it needed. So, a big lesson there is c communicate clearly, run your numbers quickly, get the strongest offer you can in, and follow up. Yep. And with running numbers, you know, I get I get asked a lot by other investors um, that haven't done a condo before yeah. is is how do you get the ARV on a condo? Yeah. Right. Because. Good. Um, this one, there's, there is 30 units, uh, but it's also a very attractive location. So yeah. they don't turn over very frequently. So Good you point. Know, naturally you want to focus on the building. Like if like, you can, if you can. Yeah. Um, however, in a, in a rapidly changing marketplace and when there haven't been comps or units in that complex that have sold, you can't rely on that. So you have to go outside the building Yeah. and then you need to compare buildings that are somewhat like size, maybe 10 to 50 units. Yeah. 
a similar HOA fee, which we'll get into mm. more about the HOA. Good use of the uh, phrase of the week. Yep. You want to make sure the amenities are the same, like they offer a pool, yep. your parking, your size. So a lot goes into it. So if you find another building with similar, um, uh, com- you know, things that you can compare that are the same, yeah. then you can use that as a comp to come up with your ARV. Okay, so Dan uh, mentioned the phrase of the week again, HOA. So this is a good spot to, to mention uh, what it is. HOA stands for Home Owners Association. Uh, HOA stands for Home Owners Association. It isn't just um, unique to condos or townhomes. There are single family detached homes that have HOAs that were created by the, commu- the person that develop the neighborhood, uh, the people that live in the neighborhood. So what a very simplified way of looking at an HOA homeowners association is it's a, it's a group of people. It's a, a, a bylaws, if you will, that specify, you know, what someone can and can't do the protocols of what needs to happen when something gets repaired. It specifies for this particular building, um, you know, what, uh, some things that are covered by the HOA, like in this building was probably trash, and uh, yeah, for this one, they covered common area maintenance, common area maintenance, uh, exterior landscaping, exterior building maintenance, and roof. Got it. Um, sometimes you'll see they'll cover cable, water. Yeah. Um, but you know, everyone's different. That's why when you when you see what you're what you're paying for every month, and for this one, it's four forty five yeah. a month. You need to know what does that cover because as you, as you go to sell this, you want to make sure like. People are getting some value for Someone's what they're spending that. every month. So it's an additional, an HOA usually has a, a fee that every person that resides in that building or in that community has to pay. In this particular case, 440. Now that's above and beyond whatever your mortgage payment is. Mm-hmm. But as Dan talked about, it covers certain things that uh, the homeowner doesn't have to pay for independently. So unlike moving into a single family home where now you've got to, you know, potentially have to pay for trash or potentially, you know, pay for your own maintenance, likely that's included in that 440. So there are things that the homeowner gets in exchange for that HOA fee, but it obviously is more money that someone has to pay. So you got to know what that is. You got to know what it covers. And when you're, as Dan talked about, when you're comping your condo, compare it against similar properties that have hopefully similar HOAs that, um, you know, you can look at apples to apples. Mm -hmm. And ours had a pool, so you know mm-hmm. it, it covers the pool maintenance, and you know that adds up every month. I think I think you have a pool, JD. Like you I, know, like I that's do. expensive. It's to, very expensive to keep up on that. So it's a lot if, of fun, but we pay yeah. for that fun when you have a yeah. pool. Yeah. And so for your HOA here, you know, if you if you find another building without a pool and their HOA is fifty dollars less, you know, you, yeah. you're, you're getting your own pool for only fifty dollars a month. It's it's actually a benefit. Yeah. You know, for that. So a well structured HOA that has you know that covers you know amenities is definitely valuable. There are other things that we look at differently when we're assessing a condo, Dan. So let's talk about those two. For example, you know, the the relationship between how many units versus financed or versus owned and rented, those kinds of things. Let's talk a little bit about some of the other things that we analyze on the front end with a condo that could potentially affect the um, the renovation or the or the sale. Yeah. So we've only scratched the surface. Mm. There's so much that more that goes into it. So Unlike a single family house where you're the boss, yeah, um, you know you, you may have guidelines, but typically you make your own decisions. Yes. Um, here they have rental restrictions. So you know if in that part of OB, you know people loved vacation there. So you know people that are buying it may want to think, yeah. oh, perfect, I can Airbnb this. Yeah. You can't. You know you need to look in your HOA docs and see that you know this one had a 30 day minimum rental policy. So no so, one in this building can rent it out for anything less than 30 that's days correct. at a time. Yep. Uh, a lot of them have pet policies, mm-hmm. you know, that size you can of pets. size, the quantity, um, <clears throat> the, you know, it, it really goes, you know, we have a, a, a three page checklist yeah. that we go into JD cause it's, it's pretty in depth, but, um, a lot of them, you know, it goes into financing. Is it FHA approved, VA approved? What are the reserves that they have? And the reserves are, you know, what's That's in the bank one. that they have to fix upcoming repairs. Yeah. And they have that. They put budgets together. You know, we knew that in 2018, they just replaced the roof. Um, do they have any special assessments coming up? That's like a big one-time fee. If they've been underfunding the reserve yep. and they have a big maintenance issue coming up, guess who's paying for it? The owners. Somebody so is. do a yeah. big capital call and every person that lives in that building will have to pony up 
uh, X amount of dollars That's to right. meet, meet the reserve. So you want to know that ahead of time. You have to know that because either because if, if it happens while you own it, you're paying it. Yeah. Or, you know, the next guy is paying for it. Exactly. So, you, you know, you might as well take care of it now if you can. Um, <clears throat> any pending litigation, yep. you know, That's a great since, point. You, since you share these units, mm -hmm. um, there could be a lawsuit going on, which could affect financing. Yeah. You want to know the like how many units are owner occupied. If one owner owns more than one unit, that can affect financing as well. Um, you know, it just goes with lender guidelines on what gets um, on what they require. So the, the the review committee or the how oh, easy yeah. or not easy it is to get renovations done. Lots of times, what's outside the four walls will be covered by the HOA, but inside the walls, it's the homeowner's responsibility. But it isn't always just do what you want. There's sometimes, many times, a review process, and that review process, as we know, can be very lengthy. Lengthy, where you have to fill out a form, you have to submit your materials, you have to provide samples. Sometimes yeah. they you meet, have to go to the board. You meeting. You have to go to the board meeting. They meet once a month if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes the review process or the approval process to get interior renovations done can can be months. And if you don't know that going in and factor that time frame. Yeah then your profit can go out the window. You nailed it. So they call that an architectural committee. <laughs> and so that's what we, that's one of the big pieces we focus on yeah. for the acquisition, because like you said, some of them meet once a month, some of them once a quarter. And a lot of the times, even if they meet monthly, you have to go on the next time that they meet, present your mm -hmm. application with materials, like you said, yeah. and then they have 30 days to approve that. And then you hope they approve that yeah. and they don't come back with any nonsense. So, you know, if, if you're planning on flipping this condo in six weeks, no way. You may not you even know, get approved in there, that time Yeah, there's frame. no way. So yeah. that's, that's something you want to know when you budget for timelines and, and that monthly HOA. Um, don't forget to include that in your monthly cost. That's great. That's a great lesson. So not every building has very tight restrictions. Some are more lenient. But of course, like Dan's mentioning, you know, we want to know that going in um, as we're reviewing the decision to make to buy it. Obviously, what that's going to do to our timeline on the renovation and it actually, in this particular case, adjusted our scope of work slightly um, by taking some things away because the review process to do that, specifically on this unit, windows, and we'll look at photos in a second, would have taken um, a long time to get approved. And um, we would have had the property renovated and sold by, could have had the property renovated and sold by that time frame. So we decided not to do the windows. That's right. Yeah. So let's go ahead uh, and talk about the renovation plan. And uh, as I have in the past, and this time will be no different, I've got some photos here that we're going to look at of what the condition of the property looked like when we uh, when we walked in for the first time. So as we're scrolling through these pictures, uh, there's there's Mr. Exotic, as he's known in our office uh, on the acquisitions team, um, heavily lived in. You got your popcorn ceilings. Got your, broken uh, heater right there. got your broken heater, wall heater right there. You've got uh, your your uh, old school kitchen um, countertop with a tile. I, I wouldn't say that's in terrible condition, but it's heavily dated. And like Dan talked about, there were some things that that didn't work. Um, namely, I think you said the stove and then the heater. Yeah. Which um, is going to you know cost money to fix, of course, which we have to factor in and going to affect someone that's getting finance, being able to buy it. And looking at those cabinets there, you know, when you look at them, they're like, okay, you know, these are salvageable. Yeah. These, these aren't that bad. But, um, you know, you got to look at them. They were actually already resurfaced like 10 oh, years ago with, with new like laminate. So it was uh, they were past its prime. And you, you skipped past it already. But the fridge, I wanted to point out. I'll go back to that. Um, it's interesting. You know, you live close to the ocean. <laughs> when your fridge has rust. When your fridge on it. has rust on it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, good. you got to take the good with the bad. Yeah. So when Dan, Dan walked through this um, unit for the first time, he actually completed the repair estimator and came up with uh, $45,000, 950-ish square feet, two bedroom, two bath. Obviously, he got one kitchen, two bathrooms, which you know needed uh, everything uh, or a lot of things in these bathrooms, I should say. Yeah, so those were newer vanities and, and countertops, so um, I did plan on keeping those. Okay. Yeah, we need a new tub, a new surround. Wow. There's a lot of a lot of bathing done in that shower right there. Oh yeah, a lot of sand has been washed <laughs> off. <laughs> so there are some things that could be salvaged in this um, in this property, and uh, we accounted for those in our scope of work. Again, forty five thousand dollars. We uh, estimated that we were going to take about a month to complete the renovation, and we actually originally had decided we originally had planned to put windows in, 
Um, what was there? Maybe five windows in this six windows. Uh, yeah. Something right yeah. around there. <laughs> but because of the architectural review committee timeline, we actually decided to eliminate the windows. Um, and also we compared that against um, no other units in the building had new windows. Yeah. Either. Yeah. When you're unsure if you should do that or not, look at what everybody else has. Yeah. If if everybody else has new windows, then there's no way we would have uh, made that decision. But um, nobody else had made that change. So as a team, we decided, yeah. hey, if, if that's an issue when we go to sell, uh, that money we budgeted for windows, we'll credit the new buyer. Give the buyer credit. And they can do it since, yeah. uh, since time a, is on their side. That's a great way to handle it. For those of you watching and listening, like let's say you have something like that come up and you don't need to do it. The timeline's going to be uh, lengthy. You can still offer the same service to your customer, to your buyer, but do it in the form of a credit, mm -hmm. right? So it's a way to get your property on the market um, in a, in a faster time frame, but not have to go through the headache many times with the, uh, these review committees. So these are the amenities and the grounds of the property pool in the, uh, in the center, the units wrap around very common kind of construction. Uh, was John waving to someone there? What's he doing over there? Was... He might've seen some ladies on the other <laughs> side of the building. Uh, John is sing never currently know. single. So when he's out looking at property, he's probably scoping out a lot of things <laughs> at the same time. Uh, so these are just different pictures of the uh, of the building um, and some pictures of what's outside of the building and the proximity to the water. So this pic, not, I know not everyone's watching this show, but those of you that are, there's a picture from our building heading down, uh, uh, aiming down the street. And at the end of that street, about two blocks away, correct me if I'm wrong, is yep. was the ocean, is the ocean, not was, is the ocean. Uh, Cape May Towers, there's a uh, exotics um, little convertible that he cruises around town in. Uh, but that's the, that was the condition of the property when we uh, when we bought it um, and or when we were analyzing it. So to focus in on, on a recap of the uh, of the repairs and the numbers, we <clears throat> we do what's needed in our scope of work. And Dan and I have been discussing some of those specific things in this property, some changes we made to some initial mm -hmm. Thoughts we had on what was needed and uh, windows being one of them. We're able to keep some things in the unit. So. A common mistake that can be made when we're renovating homes is to, you know, f is to change things or to spend money on things that isn't needed or isn't going to recoup value when you go to sell the property. So yeah. we had a forty-five thousand dollar budget. We projected one month. It took us a little bit longer, a month and a half, which is still efficient. You know, some uh, supply chain issues um, and delays gave us a couple of extra weeks of uh, working time. We actually ended up spending a little bit over 45000 Now, we took some of the money that we saved in the windows, and um, I forget exactly where we applied it. Do you remember where we put that uh, money into the building? You know, I think with um, with just the cost of materials going up, it yeah. just naturally did come back higher. So, so it kind of worked in our favor. Yeah, I mean, we would love to say that, that we, we didn't do the windows. That money was, was directly cut out of the budget, but some material cost increases, we ended up spending uh, essentially the same amount of money. And we'll talk about the sales strategy, price, and all that good stuff here next. Um, but the big lesson here is you don't over-improve. If you are in an HOA community apartment co or condo complex, or there's HOAs in your um, single family residential neighborhood, know what they cover, and then you can potentially save money in your scope of work by having those things you know, covered by the association. Um, also timelines though, that's the other big thing. That is big. And, and the over improved part is big too. It's, um, you know, a lot of investors will ask me, should I add um, laundry in unit? Um, you know, how do I know if yeah. I should, right? Yeah. It's always well, nice to have it there, Yeah. but is it needed? Not always. First, go back to your architectural yeah. application. A lot of them in older buildings won't even allow it because it puts too much strain on the current plumbing system. So, you know, before you hack into the system and tear up a lot of stuff to think you can add it. Um, I have seen cases where other investors have added it without permission. Mm -hmm. And then they they get it staged, finished on the market. And then somebody from the board mm -hmm. of the HOA goes through there. They see the, um, the illegal laundry and then they require it to be removed. Take it all out. Yeah. I mean, in the perfect world, we'd always be able to put in and we would always put in laundry in unit because people would appreciate it there. But for many different reasons that Dan just you yeah. just talked about, you know, we may not do it because it's a lengthy process to get approved. It doesn't support it. It's not needed. Yeah, it has it. You know, it had a nice laundry room yeah. on site anyway. So if it didn't have a, an on site laundry, then you know We're we got to explore this yeah. a little more. 
So this is um, after we've spent money on the renovations. Obviously, on the outside, the HOA takes uh, responsibility for that there. Would I like them to have cleaned up and painted everything during the time we owned it? I mean, the answer is yes, but that's not their, their cycle or their timeline. So we didn't do anything on the outside because that is the HOA's responsibility. But we still photograph it professionally when we're done, um, along with, obviously, our unit. So inside here, now looking at after photos, of course, flooring, new paint, new lighting fixtures. That's that uh, entrance when you walk in the front door that um, before had John down the hallway. I mean, dramatically different flooring, paint, staging. Wow, what a difference just that alone can make. Uh, we look at... Man, staging really looks good in this they particular did a, the, unit. This stager did such a good job here. You know, you that's a good point to discuss here. I mean, staging does a lot of things. I mean, it makes a house a home, but you can put the wrong staging into a home, too little or too much staging in a home, and actually have the property not be as attractive because of the staging that went in. So yeah. this isn't the case here because the stager nailed it. The 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 type of furniture that that they used. Um, the combination of colors and textures that you're looking at in these photos fit the unit, fit the building, fit the neighborhood, fit Ocean Beach in general. I noticed we did um, hardwood or I guess that's um, laminate laminate or luxury vinyl. Luxury vinyl. The fact that anybody put those two words together is, <laughs> is pretty funny. That should have been our, our phrase <laughs> of the week, luxury vinyl. But, you know, um, uh, if you're on a different floor, you know, again, we go back to the HOA. That's, yeah. that's the word of the week is they have all these guidelines you have to follow. If you're on the second and third floor, you can't have this. You have to have carpet due to noise issues. So the fact that we're on the bottom floor, we could have our luxury vinyl. Luxury vinyl. Two, yeah, you're right. Two words that um, probably have never been, shouldn't be used together <laughs> for sure. That's a good, that's a good point there. Like Dan mentioned, the, depending on what level, what level floor you're on, in a building may also change your scope of work. Um, but we were able to use luxury vinyl here and it, it certainly looks good in, in this unit. Uh, there's a shot of the hallway facing back to the front door. Lots of good light in this unit, which um, when everything's renovated, we photograph it right, makes the unit feel a lot bigger. Notice the, the table here that they used for the, the dining area wasn't too big. Um, so it makes the overall space feel feel better. And using glass too, yeah. you know, that, that's a little trick that mm -hmm. stages like to do is it, it's, it shows the space, but it looks small or, you know, yeah. it, it makes the space feel bigger. So great little kitchen. Again, the, what, what we're offering here is not um, an enormous uh, living space. It's uh, proximity to everything that this neighborhood has to offer, two parking spots, it's uh, aff affordable, frankly, living in the Point Loma Ocean Beach area and an extremely nice two bedroom, two bath condominium here. So there is a picture for those of you that are watching. For those of you that aren't, you should go back and watch because this is a great photo of the bathroom showcasing some things we changed, tub surround, flooring, toilet, fixtures, and then some things that were, were left, which in this one, I believe is the vanity. The vanity, the sink, and then the tub, we actually reglazed. Okay, so reglazed it and, and put in a plastic surround. That's right. Yeah, so cut the cost of the bath renovation, you know, basically in half from what it would normally be. So these are some pictures of, of after, um, you know, you look at, looking at this photo, those of you that are watching, this is outside one of the bedroom windows great light. I mean, beach lifestyle. You've got these uh, Cape Cod style homes across the street, white picket fence, palm trees. I mean, this property screams beach living right here. Mm. Yeah, those beach bungalows over there. Those beach bungalows. There's oh, look a, at that staging uh, in the corner. Just doesn't get any better than that, folks. I mean, surfboard propped up right in the corner. This particular surfboard, for those of you watching or listening, not watching as the CT Homes logo on it, you know, nothing's neutral in these renovations when it comes to, you know, any work that we do uh, or staging. So this is what it looks like uh, today. We don't own it anymore because we sold it, which we'll talk about next. But we chose uh, one bathroom and made that one more of the quote unquote master bathroom. Um, well, it was the master bathroom. And in this particular case, you know, nice surround Glass and that was there closure. too, you know, so at some point, maybe five years ago, within five years, the, the previous owner did the master bath. So nice. we just had to do the toilet and just uh, some some deep cleaning, some deep cleaning, deep Febreze. Um, but uh, but uh, but that's going to these pictures that I'm showing of the outside of the property 
are going to uh, relate to the next section we're going to talk about, which is uh, on the sales side. So let's get back to our slides here. And uh, let's kind of bring this case study to a close and talk about, you know, how we recoup our money. And that's uh, selling a home. Now, when you renovate right, you buy right, you stage right, all those things help in your sales process. But at the end of the day, you know, staging is or sales is about momentum. It's about uh, selling lifestyle many times, which we talk about in this property. But let's talk numbers here. So we listed the home on April uh, 19th. 20 of this year, April 19th, um, we listed the home at 729,000. Now, if you remember from previous slides, we had felt that our after repair value was about 750,000. That's right. We didn't feel that the value of the condo had gone down. We just decided to list it at a more competitive number, lower than what we thought the home would trade for to get more interest, more people through the door. And um, as a result of that, because of low, low inventory for this kind of product, potentially get multiple offers or just that one buyer that understands value and wants to pay more than, um, you know, more than the list price and what the property's worth. Yeah, and part of that too is, you know, we, we listed this in, in April. In March, we saw a drastic change yeah. in interest rates. Yep. So, you know, we, we saw it where, you know, we're, we're watching other actives going pending and what kind of their process mm -hmm. was. So, you know, we're, we're studying the markets so that we don't come on too high because, you know, last thing you want is come on too high yeah. and then do price drops and sit and then you spend more money with holding costs. So yep. coming on, coming on at a, at a more attractive price to account for interest rates mm -hmm. and then let the, let the market bring you a higher offer. Yep. Which is exactly what we did here. We uh, had two open houses. We received our first offer uh, three, two days after we listed the property. Um, so on the 21st of April, we got our first offer. Initial offer price for that offer was uh, 770,000. So our, our marketing strategy worked and I'll talk about the listing and specifics of the listing here in a second. We ultimately accepted a uh, price of $795,400. So we were on the market uh, for four days and our total escrow time from when we accepted our offer so when we no longer own the home was 21 days. Pretty quick, JD. Pretty quick turnaround time, Dan. I agree. So, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you were, those of you that were listening were watching as well because I've got a really awesome slide here to to focus on what I wanted to talk about with this sales with the sales of this particular condo. No matter what we're we're offering, no matter what we're selling, no matter where it's at, we want to focus on selling the unique things or the special things about that home. So as a uh, famous quote, you sell the sizzle, not the steak. And the picture <laughs> that's on this screen is a quote by the gentleman uh, who's, who's famously quoted as saying that, Elmer Wheeler. It's a picture of a steak sliced up. Is that chimichurri on there? It does. It does look like chimichurri that. Chimichurri or just sliced up parsley. I don't know. It looks good. Could be a ribeye, but it's making my mouth water a little yeah. bit. Like a skirt uh, steak or skirt something. Skirt steak. <laughs> mm. It looks tasty. But the famous quote, sell the sizzle, not the steak, applies to you know, everything that we're offering on in real estate. But as an example, with this particular unit, we're not selling size, we're not selling interior, we're selling lifestyle. So you're looking at the listing right now, for those of you watching, this is the first thing that someone sees when they pull up the listing. The first picture of on the photos is not even of the unit. It's actually of where the unit's located in proximity to the ocean, because that's the sizzle of this building. It's not you know, the expansive 950 square feet that we have, it's the mm -hmm. walkability, it's the pier, the OB pier nearby, it's the ocean. So we're selling the sizzle of this condo, um, not, not, not the steak. And that's, that's what a good listing does, is it sells the best features of the home. So the photos you use, the organization of those photos, you know, which photos you place first versus last, they all matter. Uh, I've said it before, I'll say it again. We want to use all the fields of the listing, the bedroom measurements. Sometimes you have to put those in, but the size of the of the rooms, um, the description, of course, the uh, confidential remarks, the supplemental remarks. And then as I've, I've said before, a buying decision is always emotion, especially when someone's buying their primary residence or their next you know home. Or in this particular case, the buyer of this home was a... Um, younger person whose family was helping them buy the home because they were, uh, she was going to school nearby okay. and they wanted, um, rather than pay 
have them pay for rent or her pay for a dorm. This was an opportunity for them to invest in real estate, have their daughter go live in this property while she was going to school and then transition it into a rental after that. Yeah, I don't know how smart that is because uh, if I lived there in college, JD, I don't think I'd be getting much homework done. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I would agree with you, but maybe she was uh, uh, more studious than, <laughs> than you and I were back in the day. I'm going to read this description for you. Notice what I'm selling is I'm not, I'm not selling the unit, I'm selling the lifestyle. This is the remarks that we put into the listing. Location, location, location. Live in the heart of OB with walking distance to beautiful beaches, restaurants, shopping, coffee shops, parks, and more. Stroll to the farmer's market every Wednesday afternoon or, Dan, watch the sunset from the local rooftop bar or the famous sunset cliffs just minutes from your house. Lay poolside all summer long in your, all summer, JD. all summer long in your <laughs> private gated building. Then retreat to your own light and bright ground floor unit. Come enjoy. Now, that's a description. Notice there's only one short sentence about the actual property. Everything else is about where the property is located. That's the, a good point. the line of lay poolside all summer long in your private gated building. Then retreat to your unit. Notice we're not talking about two bedrooms, remodeled kitchen, new flooring, stainless steel appliances, stainless steel appliances <laughs> all the things that people can obviously see from the photos. This whole sales, the whole sales process of this unit was based off of lifestyle. Dan, once again, we're selling the sizzle, not the steak. We definitely are on this one. And all of them. I mean, what are and we talking all about? All of them. Exactly. Now, I've mentioned uh, this before, but I thought it'd be a good point to revisit our CT certified process. So for those of you that um, don't remember, or you're listening or watching for the first time, about two and a half years ago, we developed uh, CT certified, which is for us on the sales side, uh, having a list of the 10 or eight most common things that we always have to do when we go to sell a home, um, get uh, a home inspection, have escrow opened here in California, title, professional cleaning, virtual tours, things like that, things that we're going to do anyways, and then market them and advertise them as, as something unique that we've either already done or have prepared or paid for, for our ultimate buyer. And that's what the CT certified pro, um, process is. Now, recently we've made a couple of adjustments to that based off of what the market's been doing. So as Dan alluded to, or, or mentioned a moment ago, interest rates have gone up quite a bit. So we're a couple of months ago, someone could get a sub 3% 30-year fixed rate. That's now in the mid fives. Mm -hmm. It's a big difference. So what we've done on the certified side is we've offered and we, we have it be, a um, in many cases, a standard part of our sales process, a $5,000 credit that someone can use to, re to buy down their rate. So that's a new certification point for us at CT Homes, which gives someone the ability uh, they don't have to think about it, negotiate it, worry about it with us, but they can apply $5,000 towards reducing their interest rate on their loan. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, most of the time a lender will allow a borrower to pay additional money to get their interest rate from whatever number they're at to a lower number, a half a percent lower, a quarter of a percent lower, even sometimes a whole percent lower if someone's willing to put enough money yeah. down. So it basically, when someone buys a home from us here in San Diego, they can automatically get a lower interest rate with help from us, the seller. And that's a, it's a, it's a great objection handler. Yeah. You know, as people are shopping for houses and it's like, oh, the rates are so high. Boom, JD yeah, has solved that, that. With, uh, with the certification yeah. here. So that, of course, helped our buyer feel more comfortable about writing a stronger offer, getting into the home faster, uh, having this... Uh, experience be better buying from us or buying from you if you follow the things that you're learning in this case study. And let's bring this whole thing together, wrap up uh, some of the things we've already talked about, and uh, we'll talk about the uh, profitability here as well. Reminder, we bought the home for our, our purchase price after commissions were brought back, $605,000. We bought the condo in February, uh, February 25th of 2022, original ARV of 750 but through the renovation process, adding some things on the certification side, the low inventory in our marketplace and even lower inventory in this neighborhood for this kind of, um, of home allowed us to sell the home for 
uh, we had a market value of 790,000, but we ended up selling it for 795,400. We spent 45,000, just a little bit over in renovation, 45 and change. Our financing cost for the money that we borrowed was about 10,000, a little bit above that actually. Transactional costs, utilities, insurance, commissions, closing costs was a touch over 30,000. We sold the home for 975,400. And we closed on the home and sold it to the new owners on May 13th, 2022. That's actually Deborah's birthday. Ah, uh, happy uh, birthday, Deborah! Yes, Friday the 13th. We sold the home on Friday the 13th to um, a great new uh, owner. And when you plug all those numbers in, close everything out in QuickBooks, this particular condo uh, netted uh, our gross profit at CT Homes was $97,726.34. Now, not guaranteeing anyone that every deal is profitable because there's risk in everything that we do. But when you buy good real estate in good locations and apply good principles like we teach and talk about here at Fortune Builders and on this podcast, you can make money in real estate, Dan. That's good. <laughs> Anything else you want to add um, here as we uh, as we sign off on this particular case study for Kate May? I do have one question for yes, you. Yes, please. Oh, this I feel like I need to set well, up my well, seat No, for this it, one. It's, it's not a trick question or... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's probably not even funny. It's not funny. Um, <laughs> but the sales price, so you got the offer at yes. 795 400 Was that countered or was that an organic offer that came in? And if it was organic, did they did they explain why they added 400 at the end? Why it's such an odd number? So good question. And that is not what they countered uh, at. That was the number that I presented to them. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why I picked a number that wasn't just a round number. Um, and you know some of this because we, we study this in communication and negotiation. Um, by picking a specific number, in this case, 795,400, and, and we did, it shows the other person that you're negotiating with that you, you know, many times you put actual thought and detail into that decision and that mm -hmm. number that you went back with, which we did. I, I, um, the offer that we received was uh, 770000 That was their original offer. So rather than go back and forth on paper with, um, with the, the buyer um, through the agent, I asked the agent to ask the buyer, in, in lieu of receiving other offers which are coming, would you like me to talk to my partners, because I, I have partners, mm -hmm. and get, them, get your clients to take it off the market price? Um, they said yes. And I said, we can do that or we can wait to see what other offers come in. And which means they could pay even more, which means they could pay even yeah. more. And as a result, get you a multiple counter. If we if I get you um, an offer now, we don't have any written offers. So it would be your property, your client's property to take at that number. She said yes. And so I went. Uh, they said yes. It was not she. It was a gentleman who was representing the buyers. So I calculated the numbers. Part of the reason uh, I, I came up with that number is because we also counted on closing time frame. So we were able to close the property a little faster, which saved us mm. holding costs, utilities. So I factor all those things in. Um, and I came up with that number of 795,400, which was you know not an exact number based off of the reduction of costs and closing faster, but it showed them. And I did put more thought into that particular number for that reason. It's a great answer. Thank, thank you. And that is why we came up with that number. They accepted it. We opened escrow. In 21 days, they were moving their things into Cape May. And here we are now. Here we are, on, here we are now doing case study. <laughs> so I think it's been about a month since we did our last case study. Again, you know, we've committed to trying to do one of these case studies a month. This is Cape May that we just wrapped up. The first time that we've done a uh, condo. Lots of learning lessons there. It directly plays into our word or phrase or acronym of the week, HOA, Homeowners Association. Dan, as always, thanks for joining me on these thanks case for studies. Thanks me, J.D. Always fun. You're welcome. Everyone watching, listening, thank you very much for tuning in. Please give us feedback. Share this training. Go to fortunebuildershow.com to get signed up for additional training. Let us know what you want to learn more about. And as always, we'll see you on the next podcast. Take care, everyone.